digital and the virtual lights on for, for all of us to enjoy this experience. Um, I'd like to introduce Gina Carey. She um, is, there she is. <laughs> She's a very active uh, and enthusiastic volunteer guide. I would say a master guide, a guide of guides at the <laughs> Philadelphia Museum of Art for more than 20, uh, 15 years. Um, and she holds a, a BA from Pennsylvania, Penn State in art and architectural history, specializing in medieval and early modern. So um, she came to the Ardens through her brother um, and, uh, and the Arden Fair and has lived here for three years, I guess is what she said, Gina. Yeah. And um, we're very happy she's here. She um, has um, enthusiastically decided to uh, loan her talents to us at the Scholars Guild for the evening. Uh, and she was very involved with um, the Gardener's Guild and I think still is, but she was guild mistress for, a few, for several years. So um, tonight's presentation, I'm going to do, um, she's going to be sharing her screen and I'm sending it over to you, Gina. Thank you very much, Jen. And hi, everybody. It's so nice to see your faces, even if you're not live. Um, and I'm so happy to be showing you what did you do during COVID? Well, I had a couple of very quiet months. I bet some of you also did. And after the killing of George Floyd and all of the interest in Black Lives Matter, I realized I didn't know anything about the history of Black or African people. So I took on this project to learn and created a presentation, which I have given before, and I just hope you will enjoy it. So I want to share the screen now and find my presentation, which is already started. And I'm going to um, stop my video because I get too distracted looking at me. So here we go. This is about arts from the cultures. There are many, many, and the empires. Who knew there were empires on the shores of the Sahara? The, this is from three recent exhibitions within the last year, actually, at the Aga Khan Museum in Toronto, the Block Museum at Northwestern University, and the fabulous Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. Did anybody happen to go to any of them? Me either, because you know, COVID. So um, this says Shores of the Sahara, but the titles of two of these exhibitions use the word Sahel, S-A-H-E-L, which means shores in Arabic. So the Sahara is considered a great big sea and the shores are the area of Africa I'll show you next. Okay. So it's a blurry map of the world, but you can see it goes all the way over to China. There's India, the Asian uh, steppes and the Gobi Desert, Europe, and way up there is Britain. Sorry. So the Sahel goes from the coast of West Africa across the desert and then down about here. So that's the area called the shores of the Sahara. And these are the countries that are represented by it today. It actually covers up to Chad. And as we'll see, these various empires and uh, time periods of popularity and power shift from west to east. And we're going to talk about the time period from about 700 AD to about 1300. So the medieval period of this region of Africa. Here's another map. And um, now you see these areas of the Sahel start at the left. Over here we have Senegal and uh, today this is more Mauritania. This is um, 
in the 13th, in the Middle Ages, this was Ghana. It is now down here. But Ghana was also known as Wagadu, W-A-G-A-D-U, just like it sounds. And uh, the main thing I wanted to show you here was Arabia, which is in those light green area. And the different Arabian colonies or um, polities or PowerPoints that moved first over the top part of Africa, got stronghold, strongholds as far as middle of Spain, included Morocco, Algeria, and Tunisia. And all of these areas are areas with any stripe or marking in them that were conquered by the Arabs. So Arabia contributed many things to um, African areas. So this is Ghana. The next one is going to be Mali. You can see here Timbuktu and their uh, town called Gao. And each one progressively becomes stronger from west to east. Here's another map. This one is showing Ghana in green. And do you see the um, caravan routes? What are going to be called the gold routes through Mexico, through uh, Africa? And there are so many of them. Who knew? I certainly didn't. And I, even though I have a degree in medieval art history, no one ever said the word Africa in any of my classes. I also did not learn anything about Africa in grade school, high school, or college, or throughout my life. So that's one reason for my recent interest. The first thing that got Ghana started in, in the world map was its organization and wonderful ability to mine salt from the desert. Here you can see slabs of salt and they are wrapped and tied by, of course, handmade rope. You can see it here. Then they will be placed on the backs of camels. And you can see already one of the things I love about camels, they do not, they will not line up properly. And here they are stacked onto the camel's backs. They're getting ready to take this salt from where we saw it in Southwestern that part of Africa from that Ghanaian area. And they're going to take them across the Sahara Desert, which you can see clearly in the background. And that will take about two months on average. I just love camels. Do you see this guy? He's got these huge sandy color, he's all sandy colored, huge sandy colored eyebrows. Then he's got these big dark, lovable eyes with three different uh, ways of closing his lids over his eyes. And then these huge doll-like black uh, lashes. And I just don't think a person can look into the face of a camel and not fall in love with it. As I did when I was in Morocco a few years ago and I went on a caravan. Now the caravan gets ready and off they go. You can see they're carrying the slabs of salt by the way, camels, you know, did not originate in Africa. They were traded for from Arabia. And now, of course, they're very, very happy throughout this whole region of the Sahel. And uh, they still go on camel trains from what, for what, <laughs> once in a while, because uh, there's still some people still get money taking salt to other places. Now they might have started from a town like this. It's made of um, the tower, the minaret, early form of a minaret, looks like it's made of um, bricks made from desert sand, mixed with some fibers to give it some strength and of course some water, and then they're formed and used for building. Much of the outside here looks like it's rock that was uh, formed into very strong rock walls. And here is a little bit of what we're used to seeing 
on structures like this. And that's an overcoating of a mixture of sand and also fiber that is applied when it's still wet rather than formed into bricks. Now from this town, any, anybody could stop and join a caravan or start one. Do, do you notice these little things on top of the high points of the minaret? I know they're hard to see. We'll see some up close later, but they're on every minaret and mosque that you'll find in Africa. Now, on this caravan that we've started off in that town and have the camels we saw a minute ago, we're going to need places to stop. So all those roofs that we saw are dotted with these buildings called Caravan Sarai. Caravan, S-E-R-A-I, it's an uh, Arabic word and it describes this kind of square hostel for camels. There's just room enough in the main entrance and the only entrance for a camel train to go through that would be locked at night, of course, and everybody can stay safe from both wild beasts that eat people and pirates that steal from caravans. Going inside the caravan, the caravanserai, the inner courtyard, yay, water. Now they overfeed the camels before they start on a, a caravan, hoping that it will help the camels to get through but even camels need to drink water periodically. You can also see all of these openings to niches. Here's the floor plan. There's the entrance. And you can, these niches all go into rooms or rooms inside of rooms. If it's more than one caravan, people might want to have a section. And uh, the more valuable the commodities being carried are, the more places there are to get really secret hiding here and there. So this one looks like it's bigger than the one we just looked inside of, but here's one that's more like, I think this, what we looked inside of a minute ago. There are those camels not being in a line at all and uh, with all their pretty faces and who cannot love the body of a camel for heaven's sakes. And you see that they have never learned how to line up straight. They also mix from caravan to caravan. Now, um, Jen mentioned in the write-up prior to this that we're going to see a very complete map. This is a map of the world that was done in the 1300s. And if you, can see to the right, it goes all the way over to China. Sorry, that's a detail. It's from right down here. And when you get all the way over to China, which for me is behind you people, um, you see that when you get to the top, the figures traveling there are all upside down, including this ruler or leader. This by the way is England, here's Europe, the Near East, the Middle East, it goes down to um, India. And then at the bottom here is Africa. This map was drawn in the 1300s to 14th century by a man named Abram Kreskish, if you're speaking in Portuguese, and Abraham Crestus, if you're speaking American. Each panel... Each panel is 12, 25 inches tall. So each panel is also eight inches wide. So you can imagine this is very big. And it shows all kinds of wonderful things which we won't get into. But when we go down here to this detail again. Well, first of all, let me show you. This is a trade route from Morocco to Mecca. And that's very important, of course, in Africa and for all Muslims who, as one of the five pillars of Islam, are encouraged and urged to go to Mecca at least once in their lifetimes if they are able. So here's that detail, and you can see a little bit of the caravan route at the north of Africa. And this is a king of Africa. 
We know he's a king because he has a crown. He has a scepter, which even the Queen of England has, and they had the Chinese rulers from the first century had scepters as well. And he is holding a piece of gold, rather hunky, chunky piece of gold. His name is Mansa Musa. And he is being visited by an Arab. You can tell by his headdress. And he's on a camel just to drive the point home. And he is going to probably receive some largesse from this King Mansa Musa. He is, by the way, the richest man who ever lived so far. They estimate his wealth in the medieval period at $400 billion of today's money. So even more than Bezos or the other ones. When, and he had as much gold as anybody ever wanted and more than anybody ever needed. What he did when he went on his Hajj, he took this caravan route first up to uh, Morocco and then a caravan route over. And when the, after two years of traveling, they got to Cairo and along the way. And while the two years I think that he spent in Cairo, he dispensed gold so freely to everyone, beggars, residents, um, teachers, dignitaries, royalty, and the king of Cairo, that the price of gold depleted for, according to some uh, sources, 10 or more years. That's how much money he had and sort of tossed away. So gold is the story right after salt. And we all know what gold looks like. And here is how it was worked in Africa by Africans um, in the Middle Ages. It's a pendant that is 18 inches in diameter, or 18 centimeters, so about a hand span or nine inches in width. And you can see it's fixed to be hung around a cord or a chain. And it's solid gold. It's made of big beads and little beads affixed back to the gold. And inside this circle of beads is a circle of um, open work gold. It could have been worn on a camel or a horse, but it was also possible that it was um, worn as a pectoral or a pendant on a male, certainly male, not a female figure. Here's some other kinds of worked gold from Africa, but it also shows the influence of the Near East. You know, the Damascene work from the uh, uh, Syrian re region. And can you see this, um, sorry, this ring? That may be Arabic writing. I have not been able to find out for sure whether it is or not. It doesn't look like standard decoration, so who knows, but Africa was very wonderful with working gold, mining gold, and traveling gold to the rest of the world. In um, the medieval period, three quarters of the gold in the world was sourced from this Eastern African Ghana empire and Mali that's coming up and the other empires. So here's some gold jewelry, jewelry that's made in Africa. You can see all the different ways they can work it very finely. Here's a cache owned by one person who probably robbed graves or who knows where they got all those things from. But you know, archeology span in Africa is brand new. Nobody ever thought of going there until pretty late in the 19th century and certainly no, no sustained efforts until about the 1970s. And right now, of course, Africa is a big, big spot for archeology. span I love this golden lion. He's just wonderful in my opinion. He's about the size of a hand. They love to make animals. They did hippos and lions and giraffes and camels. I love his mane here and his whiskers make him look like he's smiling, and even his tail. 
all this wonderful gold work. But before gold and before dynasties and before empires, there was very early artwork. This is from approximately 2000 BC or a little bit longer ago. Somebody found a pebble, like a river petal, and they envisioned in it a human body, a woman's body precisely. And it's about um, three inches tall. It is sandstone, so it's plentiful in the area. And the person who found it incised these lines to go uh, under and around the belly and to demarcate the distance, the difference between the two legs and the groin area. And here, we know this is meant to be a woman because she has an inward facing navel. Navels are very, very popular to show in the artwork of Africa. And this shows us a woman. A man has what we call an outie, O-U-T-I-E, an outie, and uh, would look quite different as we'll see. Here's a man's outfacing navel. And this is much bigger. This is 50 inches tall. So the shortest person out there might be something like 50, person, 50 inches tall. And it's a male figure because it has the Audi. And he's got his hand up here looking like over his mouth. This would be his nose and his eyebrows or eyes, it's hard to tell. He's also got a headdress. And uh, I don't know if that's part of the stone or if that was meant to indicate something. Then this one is just common clay, also made in Africa, but this in our time period. And we can see the, even though that looks like an Audi, I think it isn't because this is that wonderful steatopigia that African genotypes have, and it accounts for the storage of fat in the rear end in places where it was very easy to go starving. So this from Mauritania in the Middle Ages. I love it. I think it's just marvelous. I hope you do. This is, excuse me, a megalith. It's a huge, nearly uh, it's seven and a half feet tall or a little more. And it's made from laterite stone. Laterite stone forms itself, packs itself from sand into this kind of rock that um, was actually, one was borrowed by the Met to place in the beginning of the exhibition for the Sahel and the kingdoms of the Sahara. In all though, hundreds have been found and these are from the early Middle Ages, mostly the seventh to the ninth centuries. And they were placed in groups in desert areas along the rivers in the West. And they thought they might be something like Stonehenge for people meeting up or probably also some uh, symbolic meaning the shapes are all very similar, sort of like a lyre, but I don't know how to read it. Nobody's figured out how to read it yet. But when found, they were often in groups of 30, 60, 70, 80 of these in one place, in all different shapes and configurations, often in something circle-like. But I had never seen or heard of anything like this. There's so much Later, if you ever learned anything about Africa in school, please tell me. This is a kind of house that's still popular today, even though modern, modern house architecture has overtaken it in all but the most rural areas. It is a woven house. It might be uh, grasses and it might be rice stalks because that uh, the whole desert, the whole area has undergone a lot of desert, desert, desertification. And uh, so these are, I'm sorry, the phone really knocked me out. So it's a woven house. That's a fairly small one. That's probably for oh, a nuclear family or you know, as many as a dozen people. 
They also made very big ones. And I found a photo of one on my first time through my research materials and I never found it again. So you can also imagine this being really, really big and fitting like the whole uh, ruler of the tribe's family in there. On the right, there is a clay figurine. There. If you, pr I just found out if you press this little uh, dash on the top, you don't have to, you can't see each other. So there he is. He is a guy trying to get my that off, the talking off. Okay. It's a man and he's wearing, sorry, he's wearing a little, it won't stay up there, a little crown. And even though the hair is very short, it was only women who shaved their heads. So this is a man with some already sort of shaved hair. You can see his face, his great big um, eyes and eyebrows, and then that wonderful full-lipped African mouth. Below it, this is his beard. Do you know there are so many styles of beard? I saw in Morocco, I saw braided ones and ones that were cut into shapes like scallops. And this is three clumps possibly woven together to make the three round areas of beard hair. Under that, he's wearing several beaded necklaces. And down below, inside this uh, belt-like structure, there is something that is either four penises or some kind of amulet, which is more likely, I think, that's wrapped in and drops from it drops down a loincloth. So just an interesting piece from the first millennium before the current era. So less than, uh, more than 2000 years old. Some of these things uh, are in remarkably good shape. Most of course are gone. The exhibition in uh, Northwestern at the Block Museum said that uh, it was called Fragments in Time, and uh, Fragments of Gold, Moments in Time. So this was Ghana, and this is now overtaken by the larger kingdom of Mali. And here's Timbuktu. Here's the very important trade city of Gao. And this was the next kingdom to take precedence after Ghana. Here I can show you the rivers. Here's the Gambia River and the Senegal River. But down here, just above the tops of the mountains, starts the all important Niger River. You can see it going up to Segu and Jene, which, is, um, which was a town pretty much built by that rich ruler, Mansa Musa. And he built a couple of um, mosques there and libraries and made it a center of learning. It also is in a, an area called the interior delta of the Niger River. And then the Niger goes from this delta region up over all the way down and comes out at Benin in today's Africa. So now we're talking about Mali. Next, it will be the Songhai Emperor, Empire. And after a while, all the way over this far to Lake Chad to the east. Now, we've been seeing people and camels, but did you know that horses were also very important means of transport to the African peoples? It is, of course, a man. Notice his beard. Looks like a plate, doesn't it? And he is very uh, much decorated with what would be uh, bullet um, our bands in Mexico. And this horse is richly decorated. Look at that. He um, is also very short. These short horses, short horses, come from the south of Africa where they are indigenous. 
This is from the Mali time in the late, later part of our period, the 12th, all the way up to the 16th century, when the history of Africa turns mostly to um, things coming out of it by sea, including slaves. Here's another warrior on a horse. It's another Southern African horse. It's a man. Men are shown with belly buttons that are pointing out and men are always shown with very prominent breast or pectoral muscles and glands. He's also got something we haven't seen yet and that's a scarified face, a tattooed face and uh, another sort of plate-like beard. This area has, um, it's a band actually with a knife stuck in it. They wore them on their left arm so that the right arm could just reach over and snap that out and use it if needed for defense or any other reason. Here is another, I love this one. On the right, you're looking at part of the exhibition at the Metropolitan in New York. And the guy here is actually this fellow, dead center. I guess they loved him too. So he's a very young man. He doesn't yet have his uh, pectorals uh, perfectly broadly displayed and he's got his tiny belly button. He's carrying probably a ceramic canteen. He is riding a short African horse and he has already picked the knife. Well, this actually was a whole arrow one time. There he is. And uh, look at that arm. Look how lovely and attenuated that is and how plastic. Here's a comparison warrior also from the Met. And you see that he's riding a big Arabian horse. The Arabian horses were brought down from Arabia, just like the camels were. Camels, by the way, were all over by the first century AD in Africa and horses as well. So this is a, actually another fairly young man and he once was holding a spear or an arrow in his uh, right hand. You can see his knife a little bit on his left hand, his left arm. That's the knife and that's the holder. But that horse really says something that this warrior, even though he's possibly not as wonderfully carved, is a very important figure because of that Northern important stallion. Here's a figure of a man. You can tell it's a man again because he's got these pectorals and they face downward on men. We'll see women later. Look at that belly button and his posture. He is standing with his hands upright in the posture of a man praying for rain. It's also from Mali, from the still very evident Dogon peoples there. He's got a wonderful uh, headpiece or haircut up here and another different beard. I hope that is, I think it is a loincloth. Otherwise, we're looking at his penis. Here are two women. You can see how the breasts are shown facing outwards. These two women have very different uh, bodies. The one on the right is holding a baby. And we think it's a baby because how, how small he is in pro proportion to the mother. Look at that belly button coming right out. They're so proud of their male children as so many societies were. On the left, we see a woman who has clearly got scarification going on on her face and uh, a very distinctive face it is. Both these women seem to be wearing caps over their shaven bald heads. And this woman is probably holding a toddler because look how big he is and she seems to be feeding him something which would make him an older person. These all from the very end of the medieval period in Africa, as far as the 1700s. So Mali and Timbuktu and um, Agadez and Cinder to the right. 
Morocco, Egypt, and all of these now called, I think, gold, uh, gold roots, if you're American. They have other words for it in other languages, of course. Here's another very famous man I've never heard of. Mansa Musa was so rich that he depleted the price, just, uh, lowered the price of gold during his visit. This man distinguished himself by traveling probably more in the world than anyone else until the 18th century. And you can see these photographs taken of him in the 1300s. He was just a little bit like half a generation later than Mansa Musa, but he contributed a lot in terms of education about the world. And he said, as you see in the quote in the bottom, training or traveling, it leaves you speechless. Then it turns you into a storyteller. Well, here are his travels. And these, once he gets out of North Africa and goes to Cairo, and Mecca and up through the Near East. He has become shocked and stunned by what he's seen, delighted by other things. And uh, he stays in this area for a couple of years. Then he takes a, a smaller trip, mostly by water, down to the west, east coast of Africa. My goodness, I hope my mouth catches up with my brain one of these days. So he stayed in this um, Near East area and then what is now Turkey was then called, um, oh, Armenia. And we're not sure exactly where he picked the trip up at this point, but certainly he was at Southern Armenia, back up and around the Black Sea, all the way down through Central Asia, India, and several different trips on boats up as far as Beijing. Isn't that amazing? in the 1300s and then of course he had to come back. Well, the whole trip took from the age of 21 years to 45 years, 24, in, 24 years. And he stayed in Tangier, his starting place for a few years. And then he decided to take a trip down to our area. You can see there's Timbuktu. And at this time it was, Mali was the important, um, dynasty, if you will, at that time. So that's a lot of traveling. What did he do? He wrote a lot of books. And these are, there are versions of these still in publication of how he found the world. You can see this is an older one that's been heavily annotated. And we see two different pictures of Ibn Battuta, the first on a camel, and he looks like an old man with a white beard. But I don't think he lived that long. I think he only lived into his like almost 50. So he was a young man and he was not riding a camel. He was riding a horse, an Arabian stallion. You can see the size of it. And uh, he probably also did sometimes ride camels but probably never had that white beard. So um, some of his works were translated into the Italian by a historian in the 15, 1600s. I have to get around to reading one of these, one of these days. And here's a nice, I think Jen, you use this in uh, talking about this on Facebook. This is meant to be Ibn Battuta on a horse. And he lived in Tangier where he started at the age of 21. And the reason I love all this, here's Alexandria and Cairo, is it shows the little points of interest along the way. This is an area where he first saw ostriches. Now we see that Turkey is Armenia before. And look at these trips. They are marked out slightly differently because there is debate. But I love seeing his, um, idea or this idea of Mecca and the Grand Mosque. All different kinds of boats popular in different regions and countries at the time. And even that one looks like a Portuguese boat when he went to China. So an interesting man who wrote books and traveled a whole lot. 
This sculpture comes from late in the period, the 12th to the 14th century, and it's a reclining figure. It's a man. He's got his knife in this beautifully worked leather scabbard and held on to his left arm so he can reach it with his right. And he looks very feminine. He's very rounded. He's almost voluptu voluptuous. And his pectorals or breasts look extremely feminine. He's wearing here a uh, pectoral or pendant. And there's his Audi, so it is definitely a man. Whoever is coughing, could you try muting yourself? Thank you. Um, and as he reclines, we can see he's even got a pillow under him. So a very high ranking reclining figure. This figure puzzles me. Can you see on the right that he is holding or steadying himself on this heavy stone U-shaped object? And here they are from the front. He is a man, there is a trace of the knife here. His face is very, very scarified. Look at all those lines and shapes in it. He's wearing a um, short little cap again. I sometimes think this could have been a prisoner because look at that heavy necklace with rope tied around it on his neck. He's a man with the prominent pectorals and his Audi belly button. But then we look at this back and he almost looks like they ripped his wings off when he was born or he's a hunchback or something. So if that's the case, maybe he's a dignitary and maybe he's use, using these to stabilize himself when he stands up. Around his waist is meant to be the image of a very thin loincloth, much like they wore in India back long before then. And he's also seems to be uh, tied around the waist with a piece of rope and so forth. Just found him very interesting. <coughs> Here is a not very well resolved image of a suite of men and boys. If you take a look, they all seem to be men. And the shorter they are, the more they're just boys. A warrior with a knife on his arm, riding a South African horse. And I just thought it was a delightful image. It's almost from the old man with the beard to his mature son with the beard, to the next upcoming son and other son and maybe other son. Just a nice group of men in a family. This one's a little hard to see, but I thought it was a good uh, show of what one of the things that Africans imported from the rest of the world. Of course, they made ceramic objects and utensils, but these were imported from Arabia and they've even found, although you can't see them here, pieces of China from China. I liked showing this one because the Arabs had a method of glazing their pottery with white glazes and then with the different colors applied on top, inside those glazes would be gold dust. And that would make the glazes shine, which I think you can see on these two. And uh, it became, it was called luster ware. It's still available, made some places. It really caught fire when that idea went to Mexico and the Mexicans adopted that and it's famous uh, blue and white Talavera China pottery as well. These were also found in grave sites, all of them. And they show, and here's some glassware that was also imported. They show how much the Africans liked the things they got from the rest of the world, including, by the way, copper, which they favored for jewelry rather than gold. Of course, if they were uh, gold miners, they weren't allowed to keep any except the smallest pieces of gold dust. So copper would have been easier to acquire for them. And here's an assortment of the arch from Africa, from this region, from this time period. 
This one to me looks very old. It could be ceramic. I believe it's ceramic. It also looks a lot like the um, alabaster pieces that used to come out of Egypt and the New e Near East. Here's a wonderful soldier. He has got a nice safe helmet on his head. He's got his quilted cotton armor. And can you see that these seem to be strips of cloth that are then sewn together. They are made by a loom, which is three inches wide. <coughs> Excuse me. Down here, we have an intricate piece of metalwork. These are all made in Africa. And here's a woman with scar scarification on her face and on her arms and the loincloth, which is mostly what they wore. Very intricately designed pottery with wonderful patterns. And down here, quite a large metal pig. Uh, this part is not part of the pig, just so you're not confused. It's in the case behind. But this pig is uh, more like a boar, I guess. It's got big long legs and a long face and snout. Just all kinds of different sculptures in pottery, metal, clay, and uh, stone. Now, this just puzzles me so much. You know how we see troops in the Middle Ages carrying flags at the front of their armies? Well, this is like that. Um, it might have had pieces of cloth tied through here so that it had streamers to the back, but it was probably set on a pole. You can see where the pole would have fit, fit in here. And it is made very, very carefully. This is very ornate work. It is made from, uh, uh, the kind of oh, lost wax, I'm sorry, lost wax. So these two side pieces, which may be weapons or farm implements were made one way with one mixture of metals into a uh, mold. And then the mold was poured, had metal, molten metal poured into it. And then these two hands, reminding me of the prayer for water, were done with a different mix of metals in two different lost wax molded processes. And this wonderful head, which seems to have more gold than others, and this incredible weaving, all done by lost wax. And when you use lost wax, each piece that you make has to be broken in order to open it. So this is entirely unique in several directions. Probably carried, probably carried by the front person in a caravan, may have had one or more of these. And uh, as I said, may have had streamers tied to it as well. Imagine this in front of Masa, Mansa Musa's caravan when he went to Egypt and ruined the price of gold. By the way, I have a little description of the caravan of Mansa Musa, the rich man. It was 60,000 men, 12,000 camels. And did I say each camel can carry a little over 600 pounds on its back? So um, Mansa Musa and his leaders, his varying rulers and sheikhs who reported to him, this took two years to plan. All the front corps, which included Mansa Musa and the royalty also uh, was flanked by 500 heralds in fine silks and brocades, some of them imported, an extravagant display, also with hundreds of horses, oxen, cows, and goats used for food for all of the camel herders and others. And these wonderful staffs were in the front. So um, they also had hundreds of dancers, musicians, and entertainers so that they didn't have to listen, listen to the same ones every night. Isn't that amazing? This is the earliest example of writing 
on a piece of stone in Africa. It was found in a graveyard. Well, because it's a tombstone. It's the bottom portion of a tombstone, possibly a half or a third. And the writing is in a form of Arabic. And it was for a ruler who was a woman. Her name was, they all, there were many African women as, as rulers, but as time went by, not only did we forget the history of Africa, we forgot the history of its female rulers. So very interesting that this was found. You know, um, in parts of Africa today, there are still burial grounds. They are clearly separate from the land around it just because they are, have borders of rocks around them. And when I was in Morocco, the usual headstone like this would have been a rock or a mini boulder, maybe eight to 10 inches in uh, diameter. So they still mark deceased piece, people with stone. Now, here's a different uh, structure. Of course, it was uh, the is religion of Islam that brought the idea of a mosque to Africa. This one was not built until I think the oh, 11th century. And it is also made like the first one we saw of rocks and sand uh, bricks. And you see it's got wood sticking out from it and these little things on top again. Well, these are travelers in, photographed in the 11th century. <laughs> no, these are travelers probably in the 19th century, the 19th, late uh, 1800s, early 1900s. I'll show you that mosque today. Oh, first we'll go to the tops. These are actually on every mosque, all of the towers and minarets have ostrich eggs. They have thin bands of metal around them and they signify just what eggs do for us at Easter. Um, and their um, union of adults to create them and their standard, they, they signify good fortune, honesty and other positive good things. And this is what the uh, towers look like when they've not been maintained well. But here's that mosque again, and now it has been maintained and restored. You still see the sticks. And here, these are a little different. These are meant to carry rainwater off in the winter time, in the late winter, January-ish, the rains come. And when the rains come, they tend to melt and strip off this mud plaster that was, is on every mosque that we see. And once uh, the rains really get going, February to April, the teams start forming to come up and replaster everything. All the men and boys of the villages will, and in this case, probably a couple of villages, would get together, they'd go out and they'd dig sand and they'd mix it with water and again, uh, rice sticks or anything else that uh, would provide some fiber and therefore some strength. And they would uh, use these sleds sort of to pull the stuff along. And when they got to the mosque, they would actually start slathering this mud uh, covering on. So the little boys would hand the stuff up on trowels or, you know, uh, brick making tools. And the men would actually climb up on these until the very top was done. Do you see the ostrich egg? And there it is again. This is the mosque of Jenne, which is spelled J-E-N-N-E, -N -N -E, sometimes with a D in front of it. And you can see these three ostrich eggs very faintly. Here's another view. It's really big. This is Jenne in the area of Timbuktu where Mansa Musa built this mosque. 
another view from the side showing two outbuildings, I don't know why. And the entrances, of course, are in the side. Mosques are usually covered on the top half, on the top, but only half of it. So that sometimes things would be held outdoors in the open sky and sometimes behind a flat roof. This is another mosque, Bobo Gialasso, and it was built in 1870. I don't know why it only lasted for 10 years, but you know, there was a lot of warfare going on in this area for control of gold, uh, gold routes and uh, trade deals and um, all the people there and the taking of people for slaves was very common. In fact, when Mansa Musa went to Cairo, he had thousands of slaves out of that 12,000 people. So Africa began, began to be known as a very wealthy place and a place where anybody could get all the slaves they wanted. But look how many, imagine how many men it took to get up there and replaster this with mud. Doorways again, just here on the sides. This is one of my favorite mosque pictures I ever saw and built in the 1400s, so right at the edge of our time period. It is in Ghana and it's the oldest one in West Africa and it's referred to as the Mecca of West Africa and people make pilgrimages to go there. And look how they carefully find the sand with enough things to make it white in there. A beautiful piece of sculpture in my eyes. A head from Nigeria, just a little bit to the east of the Mali Kingdom and at the end of our time period. Notice first how scarified the face is. Each line or each uh, scarification mark has been gouged out of the skin by a sharp instrument and then filled with, today in Central America, they're using ash, which turns it blue, but I'm sure they had other colors as well. So this is done in a copper alloy, which means it's got from some gold in there with the copper. Look at the headdress, it's almost like a crown and this wonderful scarification. His eyes are even done on the lids and his ears are done as well. His beautiful African full lips. He's just a magnificent piece, I think. And lots more gold. Again, from Nigeria, the Eastern edge of our area and all kinds of things made out of gold, carefully worked. Some of them look silverish and they may be alloys of copper but this one is mostly gold. Now here are the things that call to mind fragments in time, things that have been found in burial places that uh, are known to have been made in Africa. We have this uh, ceramic piece, some kind of a lid or possibly a plate, some shards. This may be although I'm not, the, I think it may not be as equally, <laughs> the piece that was found from China, made in China, buried in Africa. There are all kinds of beads and stones and glassware, different colors, coins and bracelets. This metal one would have been tied across the arm. I'm not sure how this ceramic one would have fastened but just some of the things they're finding now as they're doing archaeology in the region. Clothing. This is a woman's dress and I love how it's made out of pieces of hide and covered with dyed cloth. And look at these, all these beads around the armpits and the neckline. And this would have been uh, just about knee length from the eighth century found in a tomb. They have found tombs, by the way, and there are many from Sudan to the east. I just saw a presentation on them from the Smithsonian Magazine. If you can get that, it's a wonderful show. Young man goes to Sudan and 
finds all these wonderful structures and what have you. So this was from like the end of our period, the beginning to the end, a men's tunic and it's made of cotton. Can you see it's done in on a three inch loom and the pieces are sewn together? Much easier to see up here from this very modern piece, almost 1700 AD. And there was music. How fitting that we get to music. We'll end with it. This is the Cora. It's a calabash with a piece of hide, usually cowhide, and a, a long thing, which uh, an arm. And there are sinew, sinew of uh, antelope making strings. This is a small modern one. These are two little bits that help it uh, fit fit on that rest onto your body and so forth. And here's a man playing a large one. Again, a photograph from the Middle Ages, but uh, he's handsome, his dress is handsome, and that's a whopper. And this is probably a woven dwelling and another one behind. It is a forerunner, of course, of a guitar-like instrument and a lute. This is a bala. To me, it's a baby marinda, marimba, which I studied when I was living in Africa. These uh, marimba sticks, as I call them, are made of rubber and fiber and um, don't make any sound when you hit the two heads together. But when they hit these wooden planks, of course, they make wonderful sounds depending, the note depends on which of these calabashes with a hole in it and a covering of thin membrane, which how big they are because that determines the sound or the note. They're played usually as you can see here by just one person. It's very small, it's about not quite three feet long. And here are, here is the same size with different gourds underneath and two men with their pectorals and their outies each holding one marimba stick or ballast stick. Very uh, different from the Central American and Mexican ones who hold several sticks in each hand as a show of mastery. Now, before I say goodbye, I wanna show you this wonderful hand that was carved um, in the third to the 11th century, who knows how old, and I'm gonna use it to say bye-bye. It's been wonderful talking with you. I hope you've learned new things. And now we're going to hear the music. He's got the 21 strings. And I want to uh, find my fat my face. Where do I find my face, Jen? You are there. We can. Oh, see you can your, see me. We can see your um, still photograph. Okay. I don't know so how to get my real face back on here. Does anybody? Um, I think not yep, sure. Yep, share screen uh, down at the bottom center. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing here. Gina, yeah, if you want to stop sharing your screen, I think it will be easier. Stop share. There you go. Hi. So you still have your still photograph there. Can you um, go to maybe background? There you are. I don't know what you did, but it worked. <laughs> Hi. Hi. So did you learn stuff? 
Mm-hmm. Yes, very yes, good. yes, quite a bit. Yeah. Did yeah. anybody study this art or the people in school at any level? No. 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 Isn't it amazing that we don't know anything or not yeah. taught anything about a whole <laughs> continent? Yeah. yeah. It just mm-hmm. blows my mind. So mm-hmm. when you're doing your anti racist uh, meetings and others. Yeah gatherings devoted to the saving of black lives and black people. I hope you'll remember some of this. Do you have yeah. any questions? Yeah. Uh, uh. Thank you very much. You're so welcome. You've opened all so, sorts of doors. <laughs> Thank you. Gina, I do have a question for you. George. I'm hearing all of you. Okay, so Gina, I do have a question for you. The map, um, that had even but tuta um was that where where do you think that map was created which one are you talking about the one with all the scarification no no the map at the beginning that you showed uh no. even, on the map but tuta his uh, roots across africa i was just curious was that uh a map that might have been made in um, where would that have been made, you think? Are you talking about the map that went all the way to China and showed the upside down people? On the yeah, the guy, show? well, no, no, not that one. One that showed, is the, the guy that had the, was the explorer that went all over. Oh, Ibn Batuta. Beijing and back, Ibn Batuta. That was, no, I don't know anything about where that map was from. I did when I first got it, but I have not since. I will keep looking though, and when I find out, I'll let you know. Looks like there's another ma- uh, question from Sally. Uh, where was the gold mine? It was mined in the desert, in the outskirts of the Ghanaian Empire and the southern part of the Mali Empire. And it still is today, although we've mostly robbed all of the natural resources from Africa at this point, except there are still some diamonds left. Hmm. Left. When did you have comment? When? I thought I thought I heard you making a comment before, but I didn't catch it. Oh, unmute yourself. Unmute yourself. I can't hear you. I was just thanking you for all the doors you've opened for us. How so? Um, just into things that I knew nothing about. And, and, and now I know some questions and I have some context. And I love it. Really? I agree. Who's that? Anyone else? A question or a comment? Could, could yes. Gina. Um, it's Cecilia. Um, so you mentioned, hi, that the Cora, of course, has a stringed instrument with that long neck kind of reminds us of the uh, guitar, but actually the Cora is a much more um, a direct descendant, direct um, ancestor of our banjo. Um, yes, it is. And, and the banjo is truly an American instrument developed brought over in by the United States, brought over by slaves from Africa. And so, the Army. At the art museum, I think it's interesting to point out, we are told to say, and it makes such good sense, enslaved people or people who were enslaved rather than slave because slave is automatically demeaning. Thank you, Gina, I agree, I agree. Yeah. Do you know know where the word slave comes from? No. Oh, from from the Slavs, from the Slavs? Yes, because they were also enslaved yes a lot of slavic uh yeah and the word carried through from time immemorial the, the word slave from slav right the uh the nordic people did a lot of that they did a lot of using the slavs right? they went down and got slavs yes indeed they did right. anyway well thank thank you gina I, this was really fascinating my pleasure seriously any further questions i just muted a few people because there was some background noise but if you would like to ask a question go ahead and unmute yourself and uh, pipe up otherwise um, we can say good night 
but I'll just give it one more moment. Okay, I would love to, I love that, that you did this presentation. It was really fascinating. Thank you so much, Gina. You're so- And welcome. we really appreciate it. Fascinating, beautiful work and, uh, you know, so informative. So thank you. Yeah. You're so welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming Gina. and sharing it Gina, with us. Gina, thank you very much. Yes, thank and, you. And Jennifer too, mm -hmm. yeah. Thank bye -bye. We'll see you all in September, thank you. I hope. Yes. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Good night, everyone. Yeah.